What I have on my mind today is a text I used to open services. I took about 10 minutes at the Hopewell Association, trying to, or the Little Hope Association, trying to encourage them to strive on in the cause of Christ. Sometimes you read something that settles on your mind after you meditated upon it a while and you want to tell people about it. A minister would understand that especially. And I want to turn to the 18th chapter of the book of Luke and expound further on this parable. But I specifically want to settle in on verse 8. If we go back to find, now there are about 10 or 12 text in this I'm going to cover and you could take a Sunday on each one of them I'm trying to go to verse 8 to make a point but let's go back to 17 and 20 to understand the text that we're about to see about to hear and when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come he answered them and said the kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo, here or there, or lo, there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. We know if we read the Bible and we understand the religious order of that day that the Jewish nation, that which was left of the nation of Israel, by their own hands they had faltered away by their sins and their rebellion against God and the doctrine of God given in the law. But we know that as they had been in bondage and Israel itself had even ceased to exist, being scattered among the Gentiles, those in Judea looked for the Messiah. They looked for a king who would come with an army and who would conquer all their enemies. That's important. There. There's man's doctrine. It's about him. Okay? They looked for a king to come who would deliver them from their enemies and establish a kingdom in Israel where they, them, would rule again man's doctrine. Go all the way back to Adam. The day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt be as God. That's been the desire of man's religion since the fall of mankind in Adam, to be as God. Let it be about us. But the kingdom of God is not and did not come as a physical nation with a king, with armies, because that would be of this world. And the kingdom of God is not of this world. It is from eternal glory above. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is God within you. The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, It's not visible, it's not seen, but let me move on to my text and give you to understand that the, what I'm going to talk about all is about the Lord telling them of the kingdom of God. We're going to get to a parable. It's to teach us about the kingdom of God, about living and dwelling in the kingdom of God. He goes on and tells his disciples the days have come and they'll desire to see him because he came to do a work God the Father gave him to do. What was that work? I'll give you two verses of scripture to give you that work very briefly. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing but raise it up again in the last day. There's the resurrection of the body of the sons of God. Yes. And another upon this rock, I will build my church. Now that, that relates to us today. That is our joy in the kingdom. That is our joy in this world. That is our place appointed unto us by the Son of God. And it was appointed unto the Son of God, the Christ, the anointed of God, by God the Father. And he's preparing them that he's going to go away. And he tells them very briefly, I'm just going to touch on some of these texts as I go through to get to my point, hopefully enough to just make sense, that the kingdom of God is going to come, but before it comes, before it's manifested 
And this is not talking about the day of the resurrection. I'll prove that to you in verse 30 of chapter 17, where he says, Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed, not when he returns, not when he raises the dead, not when he sits upon the throne of glory, and divides the sheep from the goats, but when he is revealed, what do we have in God? God said, I will write my law on their inward parts, and they shall all know me from the least unto the greatest. We have God manifested to us. John chapter 1 says that no man has seen God at any, begot at any time, but the only begotten Son of God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. That is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is the knowledge of God, which according to John 17 is eternal life. To know God, to be with God, God in you, that is eternal life. Now make that point. This part is talking about the kingdom. He told them that it's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. When they were eating and drinking and marrying and going along with life, skippity doo -dah, like nothing, nothing matters but self. And just as in the days of Noah when the God sent the flood and God destroyed everything that had the breath of life in it, everything in the world, all mankind, and he saved eight. Eight souls, Peter says, of the promised seed. All the Father gave him, all that God was wanted to save. By the way, it didn't say he cast them all to hell. It said he destroyed them from off the face of the earth. Now, there is a hell, but that wasn't the text in Genesis. God destroyed them from the face of the earth to move on. The same thing with Lot. He talks about Lot going into Sodom, buying, selling, doing all they do. And I'll read it the same day that Lot went out of Sodom. Do you ever read about how Lot came out of Sodom? When you want to think about grace? Do you ever think about how he backed up and did not want to leave the city, how he didn't want to leave those evil, wicked men? Somebody talking about some of that this morning. That he dwelt among, that Peter says, vexed his righteous soul. Don't tell me Lot wasn't a child of God. The Holy Spirit says it vexed his righteous soul. If he's righteous, God made him righteous, therefore he's a child of God. But the angel had to take the man by the hand and lead him out. Now, that's grace, brethren. But he makes a statement. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed in that day. And this makes a point here. The people that want to teach you there's a rapture coming when God's going to come here and establish his church will use these verses of Scripture to prove that. Well, they're wrong. Because this is not dealing with that. This is take, dealing with taking away the first and establishing the second. Doing away with the law, establishing grace. Taking away the kingdom of God, the children of the kingdom would be cast out into outer darkness and there would be na a gnashing of teeth, weeping, wailing, and they'd come from the north, the south, the east, and west, sit down with Abraham and the kingdom of God, the Gentiles. He said there will be two here and two there. One will be taken, one will be left. There's not going to be a child of God left behind when Christ claims his people. Not even one. And by the way, there will not be one added either. He says, and they answered him when Christ was take, t telling them this. They said, where, Lord? And he said to them, wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. The body of Christ in Jerusalem, we view eagles in this country as our national symbol and a great bird, but they're birds, they're, they eat carrion, they're scavengers. That's a perfect example of the religious men of the day who preyed upon God's people. Now let's get to the parable. Said all that to have you understand what the parable is dealing with. If you want to see about heaven and hell, go to Matthew 25, 31. Back up two pages in my book and you'll see Luke 16. Yes, brethren, that's talking about heaven and hell. That's not talking about a parable because it doesn't say it's a parable. That's a true story the Lord told about a rich man who lived sumptuously. He didn't go to hell because he was rich. He went to hell because he wasn't a child of God. God left him in the state of his own nature falling in Adam. But that poor beggar representing a child of God lived a hard, afflicted life. Well, you see him in Abraham's bosom in glory, and you see the beggar in hell. Another day, another time. But to make the point, that's not a parable. This is. 
And he spake a parable unto them to this end. This is the Lord speaking. And by the way, if you go back up to verse 22 in chapter 17, you see who he's speaking to, his disciples. You are a disciple of Christ. This word is given unto you that you may know and understand the will of God, the purpose of God, the word of God, and brethren, the love of almighty God righteous who cannot look upon sin, who loved you was as somebody said today, you were dead in trespass and sin. It's all of grace. But he makes a parable. A parable is where you sit a story beside a story. It's easier to understand the parable. It makes one point in the parable. Jesus is going to make one point in this parable. That men are to pray. That men are to pray. What is the context about? It's about the kingdom of God being among you. It's about God dwelling within you. That is the kingdom of God. Every one who is born of the Spirit and given life is in the kingdom of God. They may not come into the church. They may not hear the gospel, but they are born of God. They're in his family. They're royalty in the eyes of God because they're a peculiar nation, a royal priesthood, and they are born of God. They're in the kingdom. But he makes the point that men ought always to pray and not to faint. How do we function in this world? How do we function in this kingdom? More so, the text in my mind with this is the church. It is the assembly. Because Christ didn't come and tell us, well, you sit out there in the world and, and sometimes you hear my word or you may not have it. Because the text is going to be about walking in faith when we get to it. You cannot walk in faith in the way that God intends for you to walk in faith and enjoy the kingdom of God without being baptized and coming into the church of the living God. It is impossible. Jesus said men ought always to pray and not to faint. We live in a hard, cold world. We live in a world that is no friend of grace, no friend of God, no friend to you, brethren beloved of the Lord. Amen. They hate you. You don't think so. Well, what do they do to me? Look at the 3,000 unborn children murdered a day. Do you think Satan has them to murder his own? Look at the institution of marriage being corrupted. Why is that? Well, first to rebel against God. What's another reason? To cause you to lose the joy in marriage that God gave between a man and a woman and children to bring up in a family. We live in a hard world. Pray. Pray without ceasing. Paul said that we persevere in prayer. That's not a bad word. You can't persevere if you're not preserved in Jesus Christ. So you give that glory to God and you give that perseverance to Christ also because he enables you to do it. He is our help. Talking with Ben last night, the, the less is always blessed to the greater. God is greater. God blesses us. Pray, pray to God daily. I find myself in my nature begging God daily just about all day long to let, not let me fall to the devices of my wicked, vile imagination. <laughs> Saying... Jesus says men ought always to pray and not to faint. There was a city in a city, a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. I've seen one or two of those in my career. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. You notice that's not adversaries. That's adversary one. That tells me to look for one being, Satan, as it is a parable showing the truth. And God is going to avenge you of your adversary, Satan. Avenge me, my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Now, we could go back to Matthew and we'd see where we're told to pray and where the Lord says, Ye being evil know how to give good gifts, how much more does your Father in heaven? 
Give good gifts. Ask and you shall receive. You're going to ask bread, God, you're not going to give your son a stone. You're going to ask fish, you're not going to give your son a serpent. God will give what we ask when we ask in faith for the purpose of God, for the betterment of the church, for the betterment of the cause of Christ, for the betterment of our family. And it's all about Christ giving him the preeminence. But this old judge says, I'm going to avenge her or she's going to bother me and she's going to aggravate me and she will not stop. Well, I'm going to tell you, I've answered calls at work with people like that. They call five times a day. <laughs> and I can understand the thinking of this unjust man. But let me tell you, we, this is a parable. We do not pray to an unjust judge. We pray to the righteous, holy, separate God of heaven who created the universe and all things that are therein. We pray to the God of all wisdom, of all power, of all might, and of all compassion. I, Jeremiah 31, about verse 4, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. There's never been a time in eternity if you could mark it and set it aside where God began to love you. God has always loved you just as he does today. And he loved you enough that he became flesh and dwelt in this world and died for you. You want to make a personal savior? I'll agree with the Armenian on that. He's your personal savior because he saved you. And he will carry you. And that's why we are to pray. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge saith. Listen to what this unrighteous, ungodly man saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect? It amazes me that so many of God's children have so many doubts and fears about anything in this world or the world to come. But it amazes me even more so of the doctrines and the doubts and the fears and the failings of God. That's what it sounds like to me. Will they be in heaven? Will we make it? Will it be there? Is there such a place? Will God punish the wicked? Will God reward the righteous? So many things you hear. Listen to the unjust judge. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him? That is our prayers. You don't think so? Go read Revelation 8, 1, 2, and 3. The prayers of the saints taken up with an incense, sweet to God, accepted by God. In Christ, our prayers, where he hears us. Hebrews teaches us that he is a God that has felt the temptations and all that we have felt. He's able to succor us because he's been there, yet without sin, without falling. And when you come to God in time of prayer, he can say, my son, I have been there and I will deliver you. And you mark your words on this next verse. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Mark my words. Better yet, mark the scripture. Satan knows that day is coming. Revelation 12 teaches us he knows this. He's been defeated and he's come down to the earth in great wrath. He seeks to afflict the church. What is the church? Those in the assembly of this kingdom. But God is greater. Yes, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. 
Did not the devil so many and the man legion when they saw Christ coming, thou son of God, they said, art thou come to torment us before the time? Do not ever think that Satan does not know that is going to happen. And I'll tell you something else that I believe the Bible teaches. He quakes and fears until it does. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Now, here's my point. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. I have been so discouraged. Recent, God forgive me. Worry is an offense to God. Being discouraged is an offense to God, but I am mortal flesh and I'm a vile man. I am nothing, absolutely nothing before God. But I love God, and I love God's people. <clears throat> we see the church. We see many closed doors. We see many congregations where the Lord has kept the congregation together, maybe because of someone 40 years ago who was faithful. And, and God will keep the congregation together until they all die off, and then the church is gone. I'm the youngest person in my church, and I'm 58. Mm -hmm. Other than Josh and Rebecca, but Josh is at Bethel. Uh, baptize some young people, they move off. They go, life. But my point with this is we, we see so much. We such, see such a decline, not just amongst the primitive Baptists. Every denomination is failing away. If this is not the falling away, then I do not want to be here when it gets here. Because this world is vile, this world is pitiful, this world is evil. And I believe that if the Lord removed the Holy Spirit from this land, there'd be a lot of people who wouldn't even know the difference. Will the Lord find faith on the earth? Lord, are we here for this period of time? This thoughts of a fleshly man. It's not the thought of God. This is things that go through my mind. Are we going to die off? Is this the end? Will there be any children of God left here? Well, we know that according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that when the Son of God appears in the sky, that the dead in Christ shall raise first, will not prevent them, will not go before them. All this happens in a moment of twinkling of an eye. And we which are alive and remain shall meet them together, him together in the air. So what does that teach us? That teaches us that when the Son of God, Matthew 25, 31, appears in his glory, sitting upon the throne of glory with the holes in his hand and the holes in his feet, when he comes to take his people home, that there will be born again children of God in this world. Yes. There will be faith because God will not be left without witness. Right. We worry for naught. We get concerned for naught. Yes, the Lord shall find faith. But now who's he talking to? He's talking to me. Will you, point your finger back, be walking in faith? Do you want the kingdom? Do you want the church? Do you care enough to assemble, to join the church, to be baptized, to come to the church? Every opportunity when the church meets, do you care enough to pray for it, to pray for the minister? All the things entail, but that's where it begins, with me and then with you. And then he gave them a parable. Will the Lord find faith? He's going to tell us a little bit about how to show our faith. And by the way, faith is for your justification. God loves you. This faith is. Uh, the justification by faith is it says for you 
to give you peace in your heart and your mind. And that's what we have in the kingdom of God. Why should I join the church? First and foremost, to give the preeminence to Christ and worship him, but it gives you joy. I hope to get that in a minute if I can hurry through this next seven minutes. So he gives us the parable of the Pharisee. This is a parable. It says this. The Pharisee stands, I thank thee, O God, that I'm not like these other people. I'm better than them. I'm not this. I'm not that. I'll just read it. I'm not an extortioner, unjust, adulterer, or even as this publican, this tax collector, who is probably a Jew, much hated because he's collected taxes from the Jews for the Romans. And the Jews hated the Romans. I fast two times a week. I give tithes that all I possess. Look how good I am. Look how righteous I am. Look at me, God. Thank you that I'm not like them. And then we see that old publican. Lord, I tell you, this man had a better view of the righteousness of God than that Pharisee. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Brethren, have you experienced bliss? Bliss is sorrow and joy mixed. That does not make sense to the human mind or the worldly way. But when you see Christ upon the cross of Calvary dying for your sins, you have a sorrow for the sins that brought him to the cross, a sorrow for his sacrifice, but you have a great joy in his love and the knowledge of salvation and the kingdom which he's given us. Can't have that. If you're not God's, this publican, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he was justified. How was he justified? He was justified in his mind and heart and knowing the righteousness of God, the power of Jesus Christ, the power of God, and knowing that by his knowledge that God gave him, that God is merciful to him. And that he's not worthy of it. Is that not our doctrine? Is that not the Bible? And they brought unto him infants. This is not a parable. I'm going to close in just a second. I'm going to give you these few. They brought the infants to him. And so that he would touch them. And when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. Send those children away. Maybe they think the Lord's too busy. I don't know. I can't understand that because I love children. Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me. Yes. Uh -huh. Didn't say wait till you're 12 to be baptized, did he? No. Suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. One place the Lord said, that If we're going to enter into the kingdom, we must enter as little children. Examine a child. Oh, they're Adam multiplied. They're just young Adam. They're not old Adam like me. They get mad and they swing fists and they fight and they kick and they back and they bite and they holler. And two minutes later, they're hugging necks and playing again. They love. They forgive. And let me tell you what's even greater. Do you ever, can you remember when your children were young, you'd tell them things, facts, and they would believe what you told them. Yeah. Yeah. A child believes. Give you an example. I've told this many times, but as many years ago, probably 10 to 15, friend of my wife's, her, her mother died, and they're all upset because they're going to miss their mother. And the two little four- and five-year-old children said, Good, Mama, she's with Jesus. Now, that's faith. Mm -hmm. That's belief. That's a child. A certain ruler asked him, saying, good man, and by the way, I like that old Tom T. Hall song. God blessed the little children before they're too old to hate, before when they're too young to hate. Because children do not hate. They may in a moment, but it's gone. And then we have the ruler who comes up to him. This is all regarding living in the kingdom of God, this whole context. He said, why, good master, what... Shall I do that I should inherit eternal life? Well, he's mistaken in his logic because you do not inherit anything by what you do. Right. 
Your inheritance comes because someone before you has left you something that they earned, that they had, that they gave unto you. And that's Jesus Christ who bought us, who gave us eternal life. Now he says, Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, all these have I kept from my youth up. And I don't think he's being self-righteous. Because that's not the text with him. But I've done all these things, Lord. And he's still wondering. You see why he's still wondering. Jesus told him, you lack one thing. Sell all you have and give it to the poor. And he had many possessions. And he went away sorrowful. You shall have treasure in heaven. What does he say? Let thine eye be single first and foremost. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But let's go further than that. Let's get to Christian maturity. Let's get to the depth of the bone of the matter. God loves the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. God, from beginning to end, even the law, they had to leave their fields to glean. God loves the poor. Many reasons for that. One thing, poor people don't have the things that rich people to draw their eyes away from God. God loves the poor, and let me tell you this, and don't you ever doubt it. God is happy when his children love the poor. God is happy when you give what you have to those that have not. He's not telling us to get rid of everything we have. That does not make good sense. He tells us in Paul's writings that he that will not take care of his own, if you gave away everything you've got, you can't take care of your own, that he's worse than an infidel. He's telling us to care for the children of God. He's telling us to love the widows, to love the fatherless, to love the poor. Pray for them. Good, pray for them. What good is it going to do them if you pray for them and don't give them the thing they're standing in need of physically? Food, shelter. What did Jesus say in Matthew 25? Because you visited them. Because you clothed them when they're naked. Because you fed them when they were hungry. God loves the poor. You want joy in the spirit in the kingdom, love God's people, love the poor, support each other, period. This man went away very sorrowful. And Jesus made the point, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye. And I don't care if that's a needle's eye or the needle in the gate. It, either one's impossible. And he said, but with God, the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. If we walk with God, if we strive to seek God and walk by our faith and manifest our faith, it's possible. It will be because God promises. And the promises of God are yea and amen. Then I'm going to close with this. Peter said, Lord, lo, we have left all and followed thee. I realize that was a different generation, a different time. They were apostles. It's the foundation of the church. This was the beginning when Christ, and by the way, you want to see the beginning of church, go to Mark chapter 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and you'll find it there. But in that day, there were things going on a lot different. The day they had power to raise the dead, heal the sick, and such as that, that we do not have the day. Understand why. I say that to make this point. Why it was more necessary for them to forsake all, to leave all as apostles. There is no man that left house or parents or brethren or wife or children. God don't want you to leave your wife. God don't want you to leave your children. He's telling you to put the Lord first. Put the Lord first for the kingdom of God's sake who shall not receive manifold more and eternal glory. No. Huh. There's nothing you did, can do, that would ever affect anything in the realm of God in eternity. It is all there made of God, prepared of God, and it is God. In this 
present time. I call that temporal salvation. And in the world to come, everlasting life. Nevertheless, yes, God is going to judge them. 2 Thessalonians 1, began reading in verse 6, seeing it's a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. You that are troubled, rest with us. God is going to destroy the wicked. God is going to deliver his people. But will he find faith in the earth? Will I be serving God faithfully? You're not called to be popular. You're not called to be happy, although we are. We're not called to populate heaven. We're called to be faithful. Will I be serving God? Will you?